Welcome to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel and thank you so much for joining us. Let us open with the prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help us to identify corruption in our lives and then lead us to repentance. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray, amen. Uh, this week we're going to uh, con uh, continue with the thought of hope beyond corruption. And this will be part two. Last week we did part one. This week we will continue with part two. Hope beyond corruption. And uh, also be mindful of the fact that we're working from a series, God wants to be with us. God wants to be with us. A good example of, before I started this recording, I asked God to be with me throughout this recording to guide me and keep me and use me for his glory. And I'm so glad that I'm confident that he heard and will answer my prayer uh, because he wants to be with us. I'm learning more and more through this series of just how much God wants to be with us and how much he goes through to be with us. So let's get started with the text, uh, Genesis chapter uh, 6, verse 5 through 8. And you might want to read verse 1 through 8. Uh, because of some of what I'm going to be dealing with uh, is found in those first uh, several verses. So we'll start with verse 5 of chapter 6 of Genesis that reads, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land and the animals and the creeping things and the birds of the heavens, uh, for I am sorry that I made them. And verse 8 but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So the subject for today is hope beyond corruption, part two. Now, when we have a project that we're working on and something goes wrong, or we notice that it's flawed in a way, or uh, that a minor touch up or repair won't make it better. It's then that we most often start over. And that's a part of God working in us and through us. God started over, not with a new blueprint, but with the same blueprint. He got rid of all but eight of the original human beings and all but two of each of the animals and birds and creeping things. And he started over. God didn't come down as he did in last week's sermon, but he utilized nature that is under his control and at his disposal. God caused it to rain for 40 days straight. Water not only came down unto the earth, but water also came up out of the earth. This was another of God's example of his omnipotence. Then he started over. But before we get past the flood, let's look at another matter that we discussed briefly on last week. And that is the idea of compromise or the problem of compromise. Hear me when I say emphatically that more compromises takes place in the mind and thought of mankind than actually move into the action phase. Although uh, all of the thoughts that we have uh, can eventually, if allowed to go unchecked, will eventually become an act of defiance of, against God. So we must be careful that we uh, allow God to, to check us in our thoughts, oof, 
Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And then Matthew chapter 5, verse 28 says, But I say to you, and this is the English Standard Version, that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So a lot of times it's easy to sin without even committing the action. So our intent and that comes from our thoughts a much thinking about a matter can be just as much sinful as it is uh, to commit the act, actual act. Now, in our text, chapter 6, verse 1 through 7, some interpreters view it as an invasion of fallen angels who cohabited with women and produced a race of giants. But even though that's an interesting theory, it creates more problems than it solves. The least of which is the union of sexless spirits being with flesh and blood humans outside of God's will. It's easy to hastily do what seems right to us, but without God being with us, it can be completely wrong. Our way can bring God's destruction, while God's way can bring God's grace, even in a virgin birth situation. Just mentioning that on the fly. Even if such unions did occur, or could there be offsprings? And why would they be giants? And how did these giants or fallen ones that it really means or interpreted as being survive the flood? Or was there a second invasion of fallen angels after the flood? The term sons of God does refer to angels in Job chapter 1 verse 6 and verse uh, chapter 2, verse 1, and chapter 38, verse 7 of Job. But these are unfallen angels faithfully serving God. Even if fallen angels could make themselves appear in human bodies, why would they want to marry women and settle down on earth? Certainly their wives and neighbors would have detected something different about them, and this would create problems. And furthermore, the emphasis in Genesis chapter 6 is on the sin of man and not the rebellion of angels. The word man is used uh, nine times in verse 1 through 7. And God states clearly that the judgment was coming because of what humans had done. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Verse 5. Now, the 120 years mentioned in verse 3 or 4, uh, limit, uh, the 120 year limit expressed in verse 3 probably refers to the years be until or before the flood would come. God is long-suffering with lost sinners, but there comes a time when judgment must fall. During that day of grace, 120 years, Noah prepared the ark and gave witness that judgment was coming. The same message that Enoch had given during his lifetime. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 5 and 6 says that, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person 
a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the city of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with the overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly lives. God gave his message in the mouth of two witnesses, but the people wouldn't listen. The most likely interpretation of Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 is that God saw that the people of that day had, uh, as fallen ones had fallen out of his image and his likeness that he created them while men saw these people as mighty leaders. Now we've seen in this day and age when great leaders have fallen from their thrones, they've fallen from God's favor. Even today, much of what is admired by the world is rejected by the Lord, according to Luke chapter 16, verse 15. But God can bring down the great that stops honoring him and lift up the least that will start honoring him. When the Scythites compromised by mingling with the Canaanites, they fell from God's blessings. God was grieved that they married godless Canaanites and choosing wives as they pleased without considering God's will. Sound like us today, don't it? I'm just saying. Now in doing so, they endangered the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15's promise. For how could God bring a redeemer into the world through an unholy people? Just a little tip, favor and grace. Let's move on. The people of that day married and were given in marriage and, 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 and thought nothing of the warnings that Enoch and Noah gave them about the coming judgment too busy doing their own things. Sounds like us today, in this day and age. Human history was now at the place where only Noah and his family, eight people, believed God and obeyed his word. God's spirit was striving or walking with lost people, but they resisted the call of God. And God was grieved at what man was doing. And you can read Romans chapter 1, verse 17 for a description of what civilization was like in those days. And maybe you'll see how we are in this day and age. Man's wickedness was great. Every imagination of all his thoughts, by the way, that's her thoughts also, was only evil continually. So it was no surprise that God chose to send judgment. Now, along with judgment comes grace to those that will receive it. The only way people can be saved from God's wrath is through God's grace. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 says, but by, by grace ye are saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. God, grace is not God's reward for a good life. It's God's response to faith. Can I say that again? Grace isn't God's re reward for a good life. It's God's response to saving faith. By faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen was moved with godly fear. He prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Hebrews 11 and 1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of 
of things not seen. Faith and hope are kin to each other. Hope comes out of faith. Without faith, no hope. True faith involves the whole of the inner person, the mind which understands God's warning, the heart which fears what is coming, and the will that acts in obedience to God's word. To understand God's truth, but not act upon it, is not biblical faith. It's only intellectual agreement to religious truth. To be emotionally aroused without comprehending God's message isn't faith because true faith is based on an understanding of the truth. I suggest you read Matthew chapter 13, verse 18 through 23. To have the mind enlightened and the heart stirred, but not act in obedience to the message is not faith. For faith without works is dead according to James chapter 2 verse 14 through 26. The mind, heart, and will are all involved in true biblical faith. Everybody who has ever been saved from sin has been saved by grace through faith. And this includes those Old Testament faith walkers who found grace in God's eyes and are listed in Hebrews chapter 11. Nobody was ever saved by bringing a sacrifice or by keeping the law or by doing good works. Salvation is a gracious gift that can be rejected or received by faith. And like Noah, we must all find grace in the eyes of the Lord. In the Old Testament, Isaac, the son of Abraham, was taken up on the mountain to be offered as a sacrifice. Isaac points forward to Jesus Christ because he was a chosen sacrifice not to save man, but to prove Abraham's faith in God. He was allowed to go back home with his father. But now Jesus was God's ram in the bush. He died on that old rugged cross for our sins, but he didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave and death with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. And now we are to present our bodies ever as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is not too much for God to ask of us. Well, I'm out of time. That's as far as we can go this week. But uh, the Lord's will, we will be right back next week saying what he tells us to say. So let's close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for your grace as a means of deliverance from corruption. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Join me in thanking God for hope beyond corruption. Otherwise, how could we ever get out of this sin mess that we're in? Next Thursday night, Lamona will be back talking about who shall deliver me out of this body of sin. She says, I thank God through Christ Jesus. So tune in to hear her again and tune in next week to, uh, as we continue to talk about God wanting to be with us. Until then, so long.
I love you, and you know God loves you. So bye-bye.